I spend a fair amount of time trying to come up with a hook for the sermon, something to engage your interest, create a little bit of tension, might be funny, might be a confession, but just something so that I know you're paying attention and get you interested in what we're talking about. This morning, I'm just going to say we're looking at the book of Revelation. That usually grabs people's attention right there. You see, about once a year, I get small group leaders who'd come up to me and say, Pastor, we're looking for something new to study. And this might be weird, but is it, is it okay? And then they'll have this long pause, and I'll like, you want to read the book of Revelation, don't you? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, it's fine. We've read it before. It's a good book. There's lots of good stuff in there. And what I want to do over the next few weeks is take a look at this amazing, weird, strange book that there is so much built up around. If you were around in the 90s, you remember all the left behind stuff and all the craziness as the millennium was approaching and everybody was convinced the rapture was coming and I was all the stuff constantly. I had a friend of mine whose wife was deep into the whole Left Behind series and all the rapture stuff. So one night as she was getting ready for bed and brushing her teeth, he laid out his pajamas on top of the bed like he had been raptured up into heaven and she had been left behind. Kind of freaked her out. I don't think she was really amused by that one. Funny though, but funny not funny, I suppose. But you know, that stuff was everywhere. At the time. And if you're a generation older than that, you remember the stuff from the 60s and the 70s with Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth and all these things and how they keep coming back generation after generation. And what I want to do today and over the next few weeks as we explore this book is set aside the cultural stuff, set aside those things, set aside some of the things that we have applied to this, and just look at the text and say, what does it actually say? What's actually in there? What's the message that God is trying to get across? So, let's start here. Let me show you the key verse for understanding this book. This is right here, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches in North America. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, the seven churches in Asia. You see, this is the piece that we need to understand right off the bat. God is giving this specific message through John to these churches. And it is a specific message because of what they're going through. Every piece of the Bible... We want to understand what its historical context is, but then we want to understand what the eternal truths are. And when we read a lot of stuff, like when we're reading the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or when we're reading Romans, that stuff is easy to culturally translate. When Paul writes in Romans that we're saved by grace, not through works, that does not need a whole lot of understanding the context. But when we're looking at something like this, there's a lot of stuff we got to get through. See, John was writing, or God gave this message through John at the very end of the first century. This is the last book that makes it into the Bible. And what's going on is these churches, and when he says Asia, he's talking about what we call Turkey today. These are churches, and indeed the whole Christian church across the Roman Empire is undergoing a lot of persecution. The church had spread rapidly along the ports and the trade routes, and now because they are so numerous, they are being persecuted. It's upsetting the order. And the Romans had a rather Roman way of dealing with things. When we think of persecution and Christians being persecuted for the beliefs, we think that they care, the secret police is going to come knock on your door like they do in Egypt or North Korea or China or one of those places, and they're going to pound on your door and they're going to ask you what you believe. They're going to ask what's in your heart, and they're going to torture you until they get an answer that they're happy with. Romans didn't care. The Romans absolutely did 
not care what you believed. What they would do if somebody accused you of being a Christian is they would show up at your door and they would say, are you a Christian? And if you said, no, I'm not, they're like, fine, let's go down to the temple. You make a sacrifice to the emperor as God, and then you can go home in no trouble. And if you went to the temple and you made a sacrifice to the emperor and worshiped him as God, you were done. And it was like, that's it. And if you were, if you said, I am a Christian, and you refused to go to the temple and make sacrifices to the emperor's God, that's when you got tortured or thrown in prison, or they would do all sorts of other nasty stuff to you. And we have all these letters back uh, from about this time period where you got the Roman governors trying to figure out these things, and they're saying, here's what I did, and they send it on to the emperor. Because the Romans, in addition to being engineers, they were bureaucrats, and they, were, they I mean, they ran a giant empire, so you got to respect them for that. But this was the situation where God is giving this message to these specific churches. And so what we want to do is we want to take a look and say, what's going on here? And we want to read out of the text. See, where we get trouble when we're reading the Bible is when we read into the text. And we start with what we have today and we map that onto the Bible. I went through this back when I was in high school, college. I get you know, like everybody who's 18 or 20 or 21 years old, you get fascinated by these things. So I was going through the book of Revelation and reading it and fascinated by it and trying to map current things onto what was happening. And it just doesn't work. It's craziness. And any time that you start with the world you have and try and map it into the Bible and read it into what's going there, you're going to end up in this weird place. So I was trying to say, these things, it, it, it's like attack helicopters. Or, you know, you go back to the Hal Lindsey stuff from the 70s. And he's trying to map these nations in Revelation to Iran and Russia. And it ends up in craziness. So what we want to do is read this text and say, what are the eternal truths that God has for us? that still, still speak to us 2,000 years after what happened. 2,000 years after these churches are suffering these persecutions. 2,000 years after John was on this island. Here is the biggest thing. Let me go right here. Revelation 1.3, the verse right before the verse I just read you. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. This book is meant to be a blessing. I know you're all thinking, Wait, have you read this? Yeah, I've read it. I know there's stuff in there about Wrath being poured out, death riding on a pale horse, strange woman from Babylon coming through. All these things happen, and this is meant to be a blessing. Let me explain why. This book is written with two different groups of people in mind. Actually, really one group handling a crisis in two different ways. And what happens is for the people who are holding fast in all the persecution and all the trouble that they're getting in and all the people who are showing up saying, are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, we're going to have to torture you. To them, it is encouragement. To them, it is saying, look, God created the universe. This is Penny just read this passage where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Literally, that means I am the beginning and the end. And God's saying, look, I will be there with you. I will be in the midst of this trouble for you. And no matter what happens in this world, I have security and excuse me, eternal life for you in the next one. And at the same time, there is this implicit warning. 
and keep, as it says here in 1, 3, and keep what is written in it. There's a warning to those people who, in the persecution, are straying away. It is a warning written out of love for the people who don't want to deal with this stuff, who don't want to pay the price. See, one of the things that the Christian church was dealing with in this time is what do you do when the Romans show up for somebody and that person says, you're right, I'm not a Christian. Or maybe I had been a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And six months, a year, two years, four years down the road, they come back to the church and they say, I know I denounced you. I know I walked away. I want to be part of the church again. When others who are part of that same congregation had spent time in prison or been tortured for their faith. And so it's written as a warning for those who were falling away. And it is this fascinating paradox as you go through this book to see both sides of it, to see how God plays out in both of those circumstances and for both of those people. So here is one of the biggest implicit questions in this book. And to frame it, I want to go back to a staff meeting we had a month or two ago. And the question was simply, are you toxic? And I know you're looking at me like, I thought we were friends. I know. Okay. It's a real question. We were having this discussion in staff meeting. We were just doing some teaching and some continuing ed, and was doing a session on dealing with toxic people. And there was this really good teaching that we were watching. And the point that the guy was making is that what the real difference between healthy and toxic when you're talking about churches and organizations is can you own up to your mistakes? Can you say, yeah, I've messed up? Can you say, yes, I did something wrong and I need to repent, I need to learn? We've all run into this at least once in our life. I remember a few years ago, I was leading a high school mission trip. And we had a big meeting before the trip. And I said to all the parents and all the kids, your kids don't need to bring their cell phones with. And I'd given all the parents a list of every, all the adults' phone numbers, all the adults who were on the trip. And it's like you could never... You could always get a hold of us. And I said, look, if there's an emergency at home, call one of the adults. We will get a hold of them. We can get your kid on the phone. And if your kid has a problem, they can certainly just borrow one of our phones and get a hold of you. We just want to keep the kids in the moment and not have them texting back and forth with their cohorts or their classmates or anything else. We want to get them focused on what we're actually doing. And so, of course, kids still bring their cell phones with. But as long as they kept them in their bag, in their tent, I didn't really care. I mean, I wasn't much like the Romans. I wasn't going to rifle through everybody's bag looking for cell phones and contraband. But I was getting text messages from one parent. And she was saying, hey, my daughter texted me this. And I said to her afterwards, we got home. I said, hey. You all agreed that you weren't going to send cell phones with your kids. And she said, no, 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 no. I never agreed to that. You just said that, and I kept my mouth shut. Oh, I was so mad. I was so mad. I held a grudge for like, I was going to say three years, but it was probably five. Let's be honest. It was pro I probably still do. Um, <laughs> First time I've told that story in a sermon, and I stopped doing youth work in 2011. So, I mean, that tells you I finally got the distance I can actually tell the story. I was so mad. But the reason I was so mad is that self-deception and self-justification piece, which is so much a part of human nature. 
And if I'm honest with myself, I can probably figure out four or five times I've done things just as bad, if not worse, than what she said to me. And if we're honest, everybody sitting in this room and everybody watching online can probably come up with the same self-deception. And what this book is doing, the whole point of what God is trying to get across through John is say, look, stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to yourself and stop deceiving yourself. This book is written as a warning. And warnings are written out of love. Warnings are written so that people don't hurt themselves. And that's what this is. I was hearing a story the other day from somebody who worked at a print shop. And they had one of these big machines that I think cut paper. But it was one of these big, dangerous machines. And it was so dangerous that in order to operate it, you had to have each hand on a safety guard. Okay? You could not operate it theoretically without both hands holding the safety trigger. So theoretically, there was no way for your fingers to get caught in the machine. And of course, some idiot figures out how to jury rig and bypass one of the safety things. So he doesn't have to have you know, the effort of holding both hands on his safety triggers manages to cut off a finger. And the owner of the print shop, after they get him to the hospital and everything else, says to his employees, I want you to clean everything up, but leave the blood on the wall because that's going to get people's attention way more than any other warning sign will. This is what the book of Revelation is. It's a warning saying, look, for your own safety, for your own recognition, for your own eternal salvation, pay attention to these things. And it's written in love. I mean, when your kid is running towards the street where there's all the traffic barreling by, you don't yell, I love you unconditionally. You yell, watch out for that truck. That's what this book is. And so as it sounds strange to think of this book with all the wrath being poured out and death riding on a pale horse and everything else, it is written in love. It is written in love to a church that is struggling and is persecuted, and the eternal truths of that echo down for us 2,000 years later. I said earlier that one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we're looking at the eternal truths, and stepping away from the cultural stuff and trying to read into this. Let me give you one last thought. One of the reasons I love reading New Testament stuff is I really feel like the situation that the New Testament writers were working in, in this very theologically diverse world, in a world where you have competing beliefs and completing gods, and it's, a situa- it's, a, it's an empire that does not claim to be Christian in any way, shape, or form. It's a world that echoes well with us. We live in a society that is very theologically diverse. We live in a place where we have a marketplace of ideas where it comes to faith. And we don't face persecution in the same way that the Christians did 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. We face headwinds. I'll grant you cultural headwinds. But we don't face persecution the same way they did or that people in Egypt or China or North Korea do now. But these cultural headwinds that we face, these competing ideas that we deal with, They resonate so well with us. And these warnings and thoughts that they're struggling with is the stuff that we want to wrestle with now. We are going to spend the next few weeks looking at this. We are going to look at the blessings and the warnings. We're going to look at this history of the thought of how people have looked at the end of the world. It is going to be a wild and fun ride. I hope you enjoy it, and most of all, I hope you are blessed by it. Amen.